This morning, I'm beginning a two-part series on holy humor. I think holy humor is an important subject because I believe God has a sense of humor, and God wants us to have a sense of humor, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today and next Sunday. I want to start this morning with a little holy humor. Adam was in the Garden of Eden, and he was out late, got in very late, and Eve was a little suspicious. She confronted him. She said, I think you're seeing another woman. (laughs) Adam said, don't be silly. You're the only woman on earth. But that night he was sleeping. When he woke up, she was tickling him. He said, Eve, what in the world are you doing? She said, counting your ribs. Let's begin with a little prayer. (laughs) Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable, for you are our creator, our redeemer, our sustainer. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Danish theologian uh, Soren Kierkegaard wrote, Christianity is the most humorous point of view in the history of the world. Apostle Paul said something like that in his first letter to the Corinthians. Talking about the crucifixion of Jesus, he wrote, It is foolishness to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven. It is foolishness to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach Christ crucified, to the Jews it is a stumbling block, and to the Greeks it is foolishness. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. This passage shows us God's ironic sense of humor. And God's sense of humor shows up in the way that God is able to humble the proud, that God is able to put down the evil with such complete ease and such easy grace. God's humor shows up in the way that he sent his son to the world, not as an adult male full of power and strength, but as a tiny baby, not as a rich king, but in born in a humble stable, uh, not as a wolf, so to speak, but as a dove, not with a sword, but armed with words and love, not with a hammer, but with the Holy Spirit, who sent his Son into the world not to dominate and control the world, but to meekly offer his life uh, to be put to death as an offering. So no wonder Paul said the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are headed for destruction. And we here are lucky and blessed because we get it. We understand the weakness of God is truly strength. Now love and laughter and joy, all can be felt in the same place inside us. Laughter, they say, is an involuntary reaction when we are pleasantly surprised between what we expected to hear or see and what happens. For example, if a man speaks in the woods and there is no woman there to hear him, is he still wrong? (laughs) Laughter isn't always under our control. And that out-of-control aspect of humor shows up in what's called a spit take. Now, you're all familiar, I'm sure, with the double take, and that is, you know, you glance at something and then you immediately glance back. Well, a spit take in humor is when humor strikes you and your mouth is full and you don't have a chance to swallow. And uh, what results is, you know, something comes out of your mouth or out of your nose, and uh, they call that a spit take. Well, my, uh, my family experiences that quite a lot. When I've got all my four kids together, they seem to get each other going all the time. It's a, it's a great thing, a joyful thing. Now, the Bible knows about this kind of spontaneous, involuntary laughter. Uh, it's not a new phenomenon. It's something, it's part of the universal language of human experience. You may know that the nation of Israel was beaten in a war by the Babylonians in 570 B.C. 570 years before the birth of Christ, the Babylonians conquered Israel. And when they conquered Israel, they took 
the people of Israel, uh, who were the artists, the craftsmen, the uh, uh, scribes and scholars, the real um, wealthy people, anybody that was not killed in the war, they captured them and took them as slaves back to Babylon. Now, Babylon is where modern Baghdad is. It's about 580 miles away. And they kept them there as captives for 70 years before God caused their miraculous release. How do we know that it was God causing their miraculous release? Well, never in the course of human history has a nation just chosen to give up its slaves for no reason. And that's exactly what happened. So King Cyrus set them free. They came home. And Psalm 126 is one of the passages that describes the joy of the people when that happened. Here's what it says. When the Lord brought back his exiles to Jerusalem, it was like a dream. We were filled with laughter and we sang for joy. So holy laughter is when we are surprised by God's love and God's grace. God's overwhelming power just surprises us and pleases us and and it brings out laughter. When I was a boy, my grandmom, who was a widow, lived in New York City. She had an apartment on 118th Street. And it was one of those really old, old apartment buildings. I'll never forget that apartment. It was really a cool place. The elevator had one of those gates instead of a door. And uh, when you went into the apartment, she had five locks. Because when you live in New York City, you know, you need a lot of locks. And her uh, living room had these two big windows, and one of them had this New York City fire escape, you know, those old big metal fire escapes. I used to love that as a kid. That was my thing. You know, if I could go sit on the fire escape, that made my day. And her uh, apartment was right across from the main gate of Columbia University. So you could sit there in the living room and look out at the entrance to Columbia University. Well, her windows were always filthy dirty. And one morning I was visiting her, it was a summer morning, and I asked her if I could clean her windows. So she said yes. So I got to sit on the fire escape and clean the windows. It was great. And boy, they looked so clean, and it was, it was great. Then the next time we visited, they looked like they hadn't been cleaned in 40 years. <laughs> and I said to her, you know how kids uh, don't have a filter, and I said to her, Omi, why are your windows always dirty? And she said, well, New York City, the air is very dirty and there's lots of dust. And as soon as you clean them, they start getting dirty again. And I mention this because all of us, whether we realize it or not, look out at the world through a window. And the world wants to put dust continually on that window. And humor is one of the ways that God cleans the window, so that we can look out. As a kid, I wanted to clean that window because when you're in New York City and you're looking out in the wintertime through these dingy windows, everything looks dingy and dirty and depressing. But when the window is clean, New York City looks alive and vibrant and colorful. And it's the same thing for us when our windows are dirty. We look out at the world and we don't see it as it really is. Henry Ward Beecher, a 19th century preacher, wrote this. Laughter is God's medicine. Everybody ought to bathe in it. Grim care, moroseness, anxiety, all this rust of life ought to be scoured off by the oil of mirth. And Jesus said something similar. In the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Your eye is a lamp that provides light for your body. When your eye is good, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is bad, your whole body is filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness is. And so if the glass, the window that you're looking out at the world through is dusty and dirty and you don't realize it, you're going to have a much more negative view of how the world is and how it actually is. You're going to miss the vibrancy of the color of life and the blessings of God that are around us. 
And so church needs to be a window washing place. Church needs to be a place where with a smile and a laugh and some other ways, the windows that we look out at the world at get clean so we can see the beauty that is around us of God's creation. Now God's grace and God's love are constantly new to us. In Lamentations, the writer talking about God's love said, it's new every morning. God's love and God's grace surprise us. And so holy humor can stay alive in us as we are constantly surprised and amazed and filled joy about God's blessings. Uh, I don't know how many of you here get the Tampa Times, but I, I was reading uh, the, the Tampa Times yesterday, the sports section, and there was just a little paragraph on page one about Bill Belichick. Any of you see that? Bill Belichick is the coach of the New England Patriots. And after every game of the year, 16 games, he gave a press conference. And somebody watched up all of his press conferences. They watched the video from all of his press conferences, and they counted it all up, and they found out that in the 16 press conferences, he only smiled seven times. I just thought that was interesting. You know, it's uh, whatever price victory, it was too steep a, a price to pay if it, if it doesn't allow you to smile. Oscar Wilde wrote this, life is too important to be taken seriously. I don't know Bill Belichick personally, but I would bet you that the windows of his soul need a good washing. <laughs> you know, laughter can be used to humble us, and our humility is important to God because we can only approach God when we are humble. Now, we don't necessarily have to approach God physically on our knees but emotionally and spiritually, we need to approach God on our knees uh, in humility. <coughs> humility is something I, I confess to you that I have had to struggle with because I'm a very confident person. My life experiences have given me a lot of confidence. When I enrolled in the Doctor of Ministry program at Asbury, they gave me psychological testing to find out if I was crazy enough to be a Doctor of Ministry. And uh, they showed that my confidence level was right at the top of the charts. And as a matter of fact, it was so high that the next step up is unhealthiness. So I had to, uh, had to watch. That's something I've had to watch, you know. And over the years, God has corrected me on a number of occasions to help me with that. And God has used laughter to correct me on a number of occasions. And I'll give you an example. I was in my third pastoral appointment. I was serving in upstate New York and Pennsylvania for a number of years, and I had these churches, they were called two-point charges, because it was one pastor, two churches, because they were too small to afford one pastor all by themselves, each church. So I was serving in these two-point charges, and the first two churches that I served, first, all four of those churches had growth. They, they grew a lot, and I was feeling very confident about myself, and I was now in my third pastoral ministry, and that church, both of those churches were growing, and I was thinking, boy, I am just doing all the right things. I am just so smart. And I'm doing such a good job as a pastor, you know. And, uh, well, I had read in one of my evangelism magazines a great way to increase attendance on a Sunday morning, invite all of the 911 responders to come to your church. So I decided to try that. So I invited all the 911 responders to come to our church for a Sunday morning to have a special blessing. Well, I got the word that the entire volunteer fire department and the, the ladies auxiliary and the ambulance crew from this town, they were all coming to church. So this Sunday morning, the church was more full than it was on Easter or Christmas. Standing room only, completely packed. Lots of Catholic folks who go to church every Sunday at the Catholic church. Lots of folks who didn't go to church. And so I said, well, I'm going to bring out my, my best sermon, the sermon that I've had the most luck with over the last few years. And it was a sermon about evangelism. And I was talking about how God fishes for us. And I decided to use as a prop a fishing pole. Well, somehow or another, in the middle of my sermon, I hooked the carpet. <laughs> and I tried to reel it in, but it wouldn't come in. So... Uh, I tried to nonchalantly, you know, 
get down there and unhook it. Couldn't do it. Everybody started giggling and laughing. Well, this, this kind of shook me up, so I said, well, let me back up to the place where I lost everybody and regroup. So I put the fishing pole down, and I said, well, here's the point I'm trying to make. I said, God knows what you want, whether it's spiritual power or health or wisdom, discernment, some of the spiritual gifts, and God uses that as a hook to try and catch you and reel you in. And I was trying to say, Jesus is the ultimate fisherman. And I was shaken up, and so what came out was, Jesus is the ultimate hooker. <laughs> well, they were already giggling, you know, from, uh, from the hooking the floor. And when I said that, the whole place just died. They were, they were laughing for about 30 seconds. And I get into this thing sometimes when I'm laughing. I can't stop laughing. And uh, so I was just laughing and laughing, and they were laughing because I was laughing. And I turned around, there was a lady in the choir who was not pleased at all. <laughs> and she just was looking daggers at me. And, and uh, my laughter just went away immediately. And I, <laughs> and I turned around, I got back in the pulpit, and I'm standing there. I had sourness behind me and giggles in front of me for the rest of the service. Now, I want to tell you just an aside. A couple of weeks later, the Catholic priest, actually a couple of days later, the Catholic priest in town, who is a friend of mine, called me up, and he pretended to be one of the volunteer firemen who was there, and he was outraged that uh, I had said Jesus was a hooker, you know, and he just really had me going for a while there. It was really funny. Well, <clears throat> that evening I got home, and you can imagine I was embarrassed, and I was thinking to myself, man... How did I mess that one up? That was the worst mess up. Oh, gosh, it's so embarrassing. And I realized God was teaching me a lesson here through humor. And the lesson is it's not about you, Tim. It's about what I'm doing with you. And you ought to be glad that I'm working with you. And uh, so I was glad that God used humor to correct me. There are a lot of ways that God could have corrected me, but God chose humor. So humor sometimes can humble us, can balance us, can wash the windows of our soul so we can see the world the way God made it. And it's important for us. We, the good thing is we can cultivate holy humor. You can uh, cultivate your funny bone. You can uh, think of things that are amusing and uh, rejoice in humor. And one of the ways that we can grow in our, in our holy humor is by loving God and by being more and more aware of the miracles that are surround us so that we can be surprised by the grace and the joy of God that is all around us. And if we do this, we'll find that it is pleasing to God, a blessing to us, and makes us more fun to be around. Let us pray. Lord God, we give thanks and praise to you that you have made such a beautiful world for us to live in. We know that the windows that we look out at the world at are constantly being dusted over by the dirt and the grime of life. We need to constantly be after them to clean them so that we continue to see the blessings of the world that you have made that are around us. We give thanks to you, Lord, for holy humor and the other ways that you've provided us to help keep those windows clean. We ask, Lord, that you guide us, that we seek to always Keep those windows clean that we may be continually pleased, surprised, and enjoy uh, your love and your grace that are around us. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray.